Good morning, summon attendees and alumni. Nova Academy is proud to welcome you from wherever you are to today's second installment of the 2023 Virtual Summit Guest Lecture Series. My name is Dr. Peter Dufresne. I am the Chief Academic Officer for Nova Academy, and I'll be facilitating today's lecture. Today, Dr. Anna Viden will be speaking to us about the geopolitical impacts of climate change in her talk titled Energy Security and the War in Ukraine, How Geopolitics, the Economy, the Environment, and Energy Security Intersect. Dr. Anna Viden is an international affairs, affairs scholar with 25 plus years of experience with the shifting geopolitical, socioeconomic, and cultural dynamics of the Arab Gulf states. Dr. Viden is a research fellow with the Middle East and North Africa program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. She has taught international relations at the University of Pennsylvania and international studies at Charles University in Prague. She has published widely on topics pertaining to Saudi Arabia and U.S.-Saudi relations. Dr. Viden will focus her talk on the relationship between energy security, climate change, and global insecurity. Further, Dr. Viden will explore with us how transferring climate technology helps developing countries foster sustainable and effective industrial production and the ways cooperation can help foster economic development and security between areas of conflict. These topics will have a direct connection to the work you will do at the summit. I'm pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Viden to you and can personally attest to her depth of knowledge on this complex topic. Following the lecture, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions in a live Q&A session. I will read the questions for Dr. Viden to answer directly from the Zoom chat. Please wait until I announce that we are entering the Q&A portion of our session before you post your questions. I will make sure to alert you when the time is right for Q&A. Further, as you move through the lecture, please note any questions you'd like Dr. Viden to answer. Once we get to the Q&A portion of our session, I will ask you to post those questions in the chat for me to ask Dr. Viden. As you develop your policies during the summit, reflecting back on this lecture should provide you with a wealth of information to pull from. Dr. Viden, we are excited to hear from you today. Thank you so much for this very uh, generous um, introduction. And I'm very happy to be with you today. I'm saying good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from Phoenixville, which is situated 40 miles outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on the East Coast of the United States. In my presentation today, I will discuss how our quest for energy security intersects with geopolitics, economic development, and the environment. In my talk, I will use the energy crisis caused by Russia's war in Ukraine as an illustration of this relationship. This is the conflict that we all are uh, looking at on our TV screens and reading about. So it's a very current topic. And so we are living um, and experiencing the issue of energy security. So uh, the questions that will be addressed uh, in this are, are numerous. Uh, we will, for example, talk about energy security and what it means for consumers and governments alike. Uh, I will provide some examples of what sources of energy people have re resorted to throughout history and what advancements have been made in the area so far. We will also discuss some of the most important international bodies that deal with energy security, such as the International Energy Agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency, and the International Atomic Energy Agency. We'll also cover some instances where international conflict have disrupted energy security, such as the 1973 October War, 
or Yom Kippur War, as it is also called, which led to the 1993-1994 oil embargo and Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine, which has caused a global energy crisis. Uh, we will address the tensions that often arise between energy security and climate change mitigation, or climate mitigation as green technology and renewable energy solutions are more costly and therefore not affordable for poorer countries. We will also discuss the current efforts to achieve energy security with green energy and how international bodies are seeking to align energy security with environmental concerns. First of all, of course, it's important to look at the definition of energy security. And here I'd like you to think about what energy security means to you and your family, uh, your country, your government, maybe your, the region where you live. Also think about what energy security might look like in rich countries and poor countries and how you in the future and now also at the summits where you are taking part can think about these differences and how to uh, make it a more fair playground for poorer countries. So the definition given here of energy security is given by the International Air Energy Agency. And as you can see, it relates mainly to economic development. It also stresses the importance of environmental sustainability in regards to energy production and energy use. As you may imagine, it's a complex process to achieve energy security in a way that doesn't hurt the environment since it requires advanced research and technology and renewable energy can be costly and technology intensive and thus less, <clears throat> sorry, affordable to poorer countries. And this creates tensions between richer and poorer countries, which want to achieve the same level of prosperity as richer countries. However, they might be unable to make the necessary investments and will have to resort to cheaper and more polluting energy, such as coal and oil, for example. Also, the richer countries have actually caused a lot of the damage to the environment that many poor countries now suffer from and are unable to address due to lack of resources. For decades, poor countries have actually sought compensation for such damages, but until very recently, these amounts have been unmet. However, uh, at the recent UN climate uh, conference uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh, in Egypt in November 2022 that you may have um, read about or seen uh, stuff about on TV, uh, there was actually an agreement that stipulated that rich and industrial countries should pay poorer countries for climate change induced losses and damages. However, it remains unclear how these payments will be carried out. Uh, the idea anyway, is to establish a fund that would help poor vulnerable countries cope with disasters made worse by the pollutions uh, created by uh, wealthy nations. So throughout history, people have had various sources of energy because energy is essential as we know to create warmth, uh, to cook food and in the more modern word for economic development and economic development throughout history. So this image here describes the source of energy throughout history from windmills, steam engines, uh, oil uh, to modern wind turbines that you can see uh, in many places around the world on coastline, and also offshore that provide maybe not a beautiful site to some, but cleaner energy. Uh, energy has been essential to physical survival, economic prosperity and technological advancement. An example of this is when the small scale extraction of coal in England was turned by King Henry VIII in the 16th century into a flourishing coal industry 
When he divorced his wife and broke away from the Catholic Church, he seized coal-rich land in Northern England. And over the next two centuries, coal replaced wood as the main source of energy. This fueled the expansion of industry and the urban population. And by 1620, half of England's population relied on coal. And this shift was extremely significant uh, in the history of energy since impact on society was, was tremendous. And according to a researcher at the London School of Economics, uh, the story of human progress from nomadic hunter and gatherer to smartphone wielding urbanite uh, youth like, like many of you, uh, this is the story of energy. So at first, uh, only the poor burned coal, but soon the shortage of wood drove in a wealthier residence to adopt it. Technological innovation, such as better designed fireplaces and chimneys, led to wider adoption. Industries from brewing and soap making to dyeing and brick making joined the, the blacksmiths in burning coal. By 1661, English diarist John Evelyn compared London to the suburbs of hell shrouded in clouds of smoke and sulfur, so full of stink and darkness. Uh, so uh, for some of you uh, who are, well, like me, who maybe traveled to England, like when you were probably not born, but like, let's say like 30, 30, 40 years ago, uh, you would find um, facades and, and of, of buildings being very dark due to, uh, the extensive coal use in England. Uh, as things are changing and we're finding cleaner ways of, of producing energy, this is also changing. But uh, one key industry uh, back then, the iron industry, took longer to make the shift. Coal gives off sulfurous compounds that make iron brittle, a problem that wasn't solved until the early 18th century with the discovery of a way to smelt iron using coke. Coal cooked to produce almost pure carbon. Coal wrought huge changes in society. It reduced the pressure on land because energy could be found below ground. Coal made homes less expensive to heat and brought down the price of metal goods that required heat to produce. And because coal was so cheap, inventors found new ways to use heat to produce power. And to meet the growing demand, coal mines sprang up in other regions of Britain. Deeper mines were prone to flooding, so steam engines were developed to power water pumps. By the 770s, a new generation of more efficient and less fuel-hungry steam engines was powering a surge in economic growth. And I am sure that in your history uh, studies and social science studies, you have heard about the Industrial Revolution. And this was certainly something that made this happen. Coal and steam uh, led largely to, to the Industrial Revolution and um, kickstarted all of the technology technological development we, we can uh, see today. Even as coal was in the ascendancy, new sources of energy began to make their mark. Town gas derived from coal became available for lightning and heating in the early 19th century, initially in London, but connecting to the gas supply was costly and its use was limited to urban areas. Gas lights made city streets safer and changed working practices and leisure activities, including sleep patterns. By the late 19th century, another type of power was poised to make its debut, electricity. Coal-fired power stations appeared in Europe and the United States in the 1880s, for, first for lightning and then to power trams and trains. Electrification transformed the home to Irons, fans, and water heaters appeared before 1900, later joined by cookers, fridges, washing machines, and all manner of labor saving, saving devices. Electricity revolutionized communications from the telegraph and telephone to the radio, the TV, and the internet. Around this time, oil looked as if it might play only a minor part in the energy story. That changed with the invention of the internal combustion engine and the rise of the sheaf 
mass-produced motor car. Demand for petroleum soared, and as the oil industry expanded, new uses for oil were found, including generating electricity. We're coming closer to our current time and the essence of, of this topic. Uh, the availability of cheap, reliable electricity was changing the world, but it came at a price. By the mid 20th century, there were growing concerns about how long fossil fuel reserves might last. The oil price shock of 1973, which saw prices uh, quintuple, spurred many nations to look for alternative energy sources. So um, the diversification process that we see right now actually started in 1973, uh, but it's not until now that it has become uh, real urgent. So looking at these pictures, uh, you have um, from energy use uh, in the beginning of history, in the use of kerosene in 19th century Persia, in the first picture, and the steam engine in 712 Britain. Um, to oil wells in Titusville, PA uh, in 1858-1859, where Edwin Drake drills the first commercial oil well. And the well is 21 meters deep and produced around 1,500 liters of oil per day. Here uh, you can see um, one of the first motor cars. So in 1886, working separately, Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler built the world's first motor cars, simple vehicles driven by internal combustion engines that run on petrol. Another important energy source uh, that we are familiar uh, with today that is controversial, but it's being discussed again in the context of the energy crisis is nuclear power. Uh, nuclear energy is a form of energy released from the nucleus, the core of atoms made of protons and neutrons. And the source of energy can be produced in two ways, fission, when nuclear, uh, nu nuclei of atoms splits into several parts or fusion when nuclei fuse together. And so the science of this atomic radiation, atomic change and nuclear fission was developed from as early as 1895 to 1945. And much of it in the last six of those years. And you are of course familiar with the first uh, atomic bombs that were um, carried out uh, in, at the end of the Second World War um, that actually the U United States released uh, on Jap in Japan, Hiroshima, for example. Over 1939 to 45, most development was focused on the atomic bomb. But from 1945 onwards, attention was given to harnessing this energy in a controlled fashion for naval propulsion and for making electricity. And since, since 1956, the prime focus has been on the technological evolution of reliable power plants. We also have, um, in 1954, um, the first practical silicon photovoltaic cell, solar cell, which produces electricity from sunlight. And our modern uh, wind turbines the first of which were produced in 1980. It was a wind farm with 20 wind turbines in, constructed on Crotch Mountain in New Hampshire. And 11 years later, Denmark built the first offshore wind farm. And that is what you can see uh, in this picture. An important issue uh, that uh, we are now familiar with, also with in the context of the war in Ukraine, is the fact that the quest for energy actually can lead to conflict. This is why, this is because the close relationship between energy security and, and economic development means that access to commodities such as oil and gas, um, they are crucial to promote economic growth and prosperity. Withholding access to energy resources or increasing the price of available resources, therefore, have been used as in instruments to achieve certain geopolitical objectives. And I mentioned previously 
the 1973 October War or the Yom Kippur War, as it's also is called, since it happened during the time when in the Jewish faith, um, the, the Day of Atonement uh, is, is celebrated. So what happened is that the Arab oil producers imposed an embargo on Western countries, such as the United States, as well as Japan, in retaliation for their support of Israel during the 1973 October War. The Arab oil producers made similar threats before, uh, but uh, Western countries didn't think that this would happen. And when it finally did, uh, it caused a huge disruption to uh, the global economy and to the energy sector. And given OPEC's control over the world oil order at this time, um, yeah, they, 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 the threat um, was real then and is real today. And as you can see here, uh, you see a caricature here of uh, an Arab leader, most probably a Saudi leader, um, wielding uh, a, gas, um, a gas pump against world leaders. You, you have some of the world leaders here and you have a picture of where it says, sorry, no gas. So there were a lot of gas lines at this time. Gas was tremendously expensive. And to prevent crisis like this in the future, international energy bodies were established, such as the International Energy Agency, which was created in 1994 as a response to the 1973-1974 energy crisis, which disrupted uh, the global economy. And here we see a picture uh, of um, the negotiations uh, leading to the establishing of the EIA. And you can see people here looking very grim uh, on this picture. So created in 1974 to ensure the security of oil supplies, the International en Energy Agency has evolved over the years. So while any security, energy security remains a core mission, uh, the IAA today is at the center of the global energy debate, focusing on a wide variety of issues ranging from electricity security to investments, climate change and air pollution, energy access and efficiency, and much more. And yes, the, the International Energy Agency was born with the 1973-94 oil crisis when industrialized countries found they were not adequately equipped to deal with the oil embargo imposed by major producers that pushed prices to historically high levels. So the EIA was established as the main international forum for energy cooperation on a variety of issues. Uh, such as security of supply, long-term policy, information, transparency, energy efficiency, sustainability, research and development, technology collaboration, international energy relations. So the founding members were Austria, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Turkey, United Kingdom, and the United States. And they were followed by other countries. Um, so the EIA's collective emergency response system mechanism ensures a stabilizing influence on markets and the global economy. And it has been activated five times since the agency's creation. So the first was in January 1991 during the first Gulf War. The second was in 2005 after the Hurricane Katrina and Rita damaged the infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico. And the third was in 2011 during the Libyan crisis. The fourth and the fifth were in 2022 after Russia invaded Ukraine. So it is important to understand that international conflicts impact energy security by causing disruptions in oil supply. And this directly and indirectly impact the global economy. And due to our economic interdependence, conflicts impact both the personal finances of individual consumers and the economic capabilities of individual states to promote economic development and prosperity 
at the national, regional, and local levels. And this is something we can all observe uh, right now in the context of the energy crisis caused by the war in Ukraine. And here you have, um, you have listed uh, some important energy bodies. I've talked about the International Energy Agency. You can see others, International Atomic Energy Agency. You can also see OPEC, which is uh, actually one of the most important players in the energy market. And OPEC was created in 1960 to as a reaction uh, of oil producing countries feeling that they didn't have a say over their own oil resources. And a lot of these players took part in the embargo on Western countries in 1973, 1974, uh, most um, specifically the Arab oil producers, as I mentioned. So when we talk about uh, the war in Ukraine and energy security, it's of course important to talk about important loss of lives and the destruction of key infrastructure such as schools, hospitals, roads, railways, industrial plants, and energy plants. Um, but it has had a huge impact on global energy security and the global economy. It has caused soaring fuel prices, sending power prices to record levels. This in turn has had a devastating economic impact worldwide with rising inflation, high energy prices, high food prices and high inflation. The war also has disrupted the transportation of, of food causing food security in addition to energy security. So as the war escalated prices tensions spread from the spot market to the whole term structure of futures energy prices, suggesting that the cost of energy will remain higher for longer. And Europe's heavy reliance on energy imports from Russia explains the market response of local energy prices to the war in Ukraine. It also is having a major impact on the global energy supply. European states have scrambled to reorient their consumption away from Russian natural gas, while Russia has used, used its energy assets as political leverage while finding new economic partners. So here again, you can see how geopolitics and the security and the global economy interacts. And as you will say, as I move a little bit forward in my presentation, you will also see links to uh, the environment. One of the bigger issues uh, regarding the war in Ukraine is that Ukraine has numerous nuclear plants. And this is of course is very dangerous since um, the war has and, and might damage uh, these facilities, thus producing leakage of radiation. Uh, you may remember or, or heard about uh, that this actually happened in the 1980s in Chernobyl. It was also happened uh, more recently in Japan uh, with a tsunami there. Uh, while those instances were not caused by conflict, um, there, there are risks um, to radiation of for radiation in, in, in the war in Ukraine. So in March 2022, uh, Russian troops attacked the six reactors at the Saporizhia power plant in Ukraine, which is a huge uh, nuclear plant, and seized control of the iron complex. Its capture and the ongoing fighting at the site set off global alarms over the possibility of catastrophic damage and deadly fumes of radioactive fallout. And this has led the international um, Atomic Energy Agency to send the personnel over there to uh, try to monitor the situation and put pressure on, on Russian occupants in, in these plants and to, to try to mitigate uh, the risk. Uh, so one way the international community uh, can actually deal with uh, issues such as this, uh, when a country um, 
for on 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 illegal grounds goes into another country uh, is to resort to sanctions and so to make it harder for Russia to carry out the war in Ukraine the international community is limit seeking to limit Russia's access to money uh, by various sanction schemes so sanctions are penalties imposed Posed by one country on another to stop them from acting aggressively or breaking international law. And short of going to war, sanctions are the toughest actions uh, nations can take against another country or actor. So there have been financial measures, sanctions on Russia's export of oil and gas, and on Russian goods and services. There have also been sanctions on wealthy individuals. Uh, the US, for example, has barred Russia from making debt payments using foreign currency held in US banks, and major Russian banks have been removed from the national financial messaging system, SWIFT. And this, of course, has delayed payments to Russia for its oil and gas exports. Uh, the UK has excluded key Russian banks from the UK financial system, frozen assets of all Russian banks, barred Russian foreign from borrowing money and placed limits on the deposits Russians can make at UK banks. There have also been sanctions on goods and services and on individual wealth individuals, uh, as I mentioned. So how can countries uh, cope uh, without Russian oil? And then uh, most uh, directly, we're talking about uh, countries in Northern Europe, and in former um, Eastern Bloc uh, countries. Uh, since Russia's invasion uh, over Ukraine, many countries have pledged to end or severely cut back their oil and gas imports. And the Russian economy, of course, is highly dependent on its lucrative energy sector. And these measures are intended to curtail Moscow's revenues and hinder its war effort. So who is still, um, using or buying um, Russian oil and gas. So as you can see here, uh, there are quite a few countries who are still uh, doing this. So European countries have been looking elsewhere for their supplies, uh, persuading other oil rich nations such as Saudi Arabia, for example, the United Arab Emirates and then Venezuela to increase production uh, and so far, these uh, demands have been unsuccessful as they have either remained neutral or backed Russia or the conflict with Ukraine. So here you see how complicated geopolitics also play into uh, these issues. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the International Energy Agency uh, agreed to release 120 million barrels of crude from their stocks. And US also has released some of its own strategic reserves to deal uh, with this situation. Uh, reducing gas imports from Russia, on the other hand, has been a major challenge for many European countries. Uh, the continent has been getting most of its gas through pipelines, the ma majority of which run through Russia. Those that don't, such as a pipeline which runs from Azerbaijan and into Turkey, haven't got enough capacity to fulfill European needs. And there has been pressure on countries such as Qatar uh, in, in, in the Arab, on the Arab Peninsula to um, produce more gas. But as it works in the energy market is that countries buy uh, access to gas uh, years in advance. And right now, uh, Qatar cannot spare uh, such gas um, to, to, to these countries. So it's, it's very complicated. So are these sanctions uh, placed on Russia actually hurting Russia's uh, war efforts in Ukraine? So it's, Interesting to note that paradoxically, Russia's ability to fund the war has been helped by high oil and gas prices. David Fife, uh, chief economist of the research organization Argus Media, says its crude oil revenues rose 41% over the past year. And oil sales make up 40% of Russia's total exports, and so they are helping greatly to fund the war. 
Uh, Russia has reacted by banning exports of more than 200 goods, including telecoms, medical, vehicle, agricultural, electrical equipment, and timber products. It is also blocking interest payments to foreign holders of government bonds and ban banning Russian firms from paying overseas shareholders. And it has stopped foreign investors who hold billions of dollars worth of Russian investments. But of course, uh, the Russian economy is hurting and individual Russian consumers are hurting because of the high uh, oil, uh, of the high prices on food, for example. So it is interesting to note that while the energy crisis caused by Russia's war in Ukraine has accelerated the diversification of energy, it has at the same time slowed down some of these efforts, leading some countries to temporarily use more coal or return to coal use to mitigate the crisis. And this leads to tensions between energy security and the preservation of the environment. Uh, so for example, uh, there are a lot of measures being taken simultaneously, and some of them seem to be counterproductive, such as the resort to coal, uh, since it's a highly polluting energy source that induces climate change. But at the same time, there is a strong realization among policymakers that the shift to renewables and green energy needs to happen quicker to reduce the dependence on oil. This is not something new as I alluded to previously in my presentation, but the war in Ukraine underscores the urgency to make this shift. Uh, nevertheless, global coal demand is set to increase only marginally in 2022, but enough to push it to an all time high amid the energy, energy crisis. And um, the EIA uh, forecasts that the world's coal consumption will remain at similar levels in the following years in the absence of stronger efforts to accelerate their transition to clean energy. And here you have a picture of one of the most uh, vocal um, climate activists uh, in the world, uh, young Greta Thunberg, uh, who is a Swedish um, climate activist who is only a, a high schooler. Um, and she is currently actually protesting in Sweden where the European Union is meeting in the north of Sweden. And she is, produce, she is protesting against the slowdown of efforts to uh, diversify towards a greener economy, but also uh, the preference that some countries have to use coal instead of nuclear energy that is actually readily available. And this is something that is actually surprising to hear from Greta Thunberg, who has actually also been critical of nuclear energy uh, in the past. So Greta Thunberg says that it would be a mistake for Germany in particular, because Germany is one of the countries that is actually opening up for uh, increased coal use uh, temporarily to switch. So she says it would be a mistake for Germany to switch of its nuclear power plants if that means the country must burn more climate wrecking coal. And the German government is still debating the future of its nuclear plants uh, to, be set, to be shut down this year, given the specter of the looming energy crisis due to the war in Ukraine. So we see here that there, there are different things going on. Uh, on the one hand, there is an increased use of coal and other polluting um, energy sources. And on the other hand, there is also a renewed effort to shift quicker. Uh, so maybe in the short run, um, more coal use in the longer run, um, an acceleration of uh, diversification efforts. So all over the world, um, there is now new discussions about nuclear energy, uh, which remains controversial, but uh, according to research, still is affordable and a re reliable uh, source of energy and quite safe uh, despite 
uh, of course, inherent dangers that we have discussed. So in Sweden, where previous governments had been shutting down nuclear plants, the new center-right government is advocating for nuclear energy. And this is something quite extraordinary in Sweden, where uh, the debate against nuclear energy has been very, um, I mean, strong. And, and uh, a majority has actually considered um, a good decision to shut down nuclear energy. And Sweden's six nuclear power react reactors provide about 40% of its electricity. Uh, in 1980, the government decided to phase out nuclear power, but in June 2010, the parliament voted to repeal this policy. The country's 1997 energy policy allowed 10 reactors to operate longer than envis envisaged by the 1980s phase out policy. I can remember uh, my mom actually uh, demonstrating against nuclear power in the 1980s uh, when I was a kid and actually me following her uh, in those protests. And I can also remember discussions uh, between my parents uh, since my dad actually was in favor of nuclear energy and my mother against. So you can imagine what interesting discussions there must have been at, at the dinner table uh, at that time. So I'm just going to go uh, rather quickly over some pictures here, uh, also about uh, in Sweden. So right now, there are a lot of ads uh, in the Swedish television, uh, in newspapers, online, about how to conserve energy. Uh, and this is because the, the, the energy crisis is, is really important in Sweden with skyrocketing energy prices. I know, for example, my own sister who owns a house in the southern part of Sweden. I know that their uh, energy bill has tripled uh, and not all people actually can afford to pay their energy bills as, as things stand. Also, the high energy cost and the high um, pressure on the infrastructure during the cold winter months, it can be very cold in Sweden, uh, makes it for a very difficult situation, both for consumers and for the Swedish government. And here, as you can see, uh, only by saving a few hours uh, use of energy counts. So th there are these uh, ads uh, talking uh, about this. And this is actually from uh, an English speaking uh, site. So it, so it discusses why a Swede should save electricity and how we can reduce the cost of electricity. And a really famous uh, narrative right now is to what people are calling to flatten the curve, uh, trying to uh, put less pressure on in energy infrastructure, because if there are too much pressure, uh, actually in certain areas in Sweden, uh, the electricity might be cut off. And this of course can cause use disruptions, both of course to individual consumers, but also to the Swedish industry. So given all of these uh, issues uh, that I have discussed and, and the complex, complex relationship between energy security, the global economy, geopolitics, and the environment, there are certain scholars, energy scholars and, and environmental scholars who fear that uh, governments will actually not make the necessary investments to shift uh, towards green or renewable energy. And uh, one of these uh, scholars uh, is uh, Faith Ibirol um, with the IMF. And he uh, writes, um, he's written several articles published actually by the IMF and the World Bank on, on this issue. So there are rising concerns about um, making necessary investments. And this is, I guess, also something that you young people are worried about that uh, what is happening now might actually 
slow down the process towards more environmentally sustainable energy use. Um, so I would like to thank you so much uh, for your attention. I've thrown a lot of facts and, and stuff towards you, and I very much look forward uh, to, to your questions that I will try to answer the, the, as best as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Biden, for that information. It's informative and certainly germane to our, our, our summit topic. Uh, so I'll ask students at this time if you would begin to post your um, questions in the chat. I will be able to uh, ask Dr. Biden our questions. We have about 15 minutes or so, and we'll try and make sure that we get um, we get as many questions answered as we can in that time. But before we begin, Dr. Biden, I uh, I have a question. I guess I'm the question asker, so I can I can get mine to the front of the line if that's okay. Um, in your opinion, and I know you can't look into a crystal ball, but in your opinion, will these renewable energy sources that are being developed create a paradigm shift in the balance of power with respect to economic security? And then I guess I'll ask you to identify where maybe in your opinion, where in the world this could happen. Um, I think there's a real uh, link between between that question and, and, and our summit topic for our, for our students. I think that is a, a very crucial question and something that I think uh, actors in this arena are grappling with. And we can see already that uh, if we talk about the Arab oil producers, which are some of the most important and, uh, oil and gas producers, they are very well aware of this shift and they are making major investments and they are trying to also change the narrative. Uh, so they are, uh, of course, part of this equation. Uh, they are polluters, but at the same time, they are very well aware of the need to uh, change, make this shift uh, economically and geopolitically interesting uh, for themselves. They have an enormous amount of resources that they can throw into this. Uh, on the other hand, we have, of course, um, countries, uh, especially uh, in, in, in the Western world and um, a lot in Northern Europe, for example, who are also trying to drive uh, even a lot of uh, corporation, big companies are actually pushing governments to uh, uh, continue and invest uh, in renewables. So they are not necessarily in agreement uh, with their governments uh, currently. Why is this? Because they are, of course, uh, in need of secure access of energy and they already are uh, transforming their production uh, to make it more um, green and more, more uh, um, sustainable. So um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, while the war in Ukraine has temporarily uh, given a lot of um, oil money and revenue to uh, the oil producing countries, uh, I think that everybody realizes that this shift is, is, is necessary. So it will play out over a long period of time. Uh, and I think it's very hard to predict exactly how it will play out, but it, it will need to happen. There are many actors that are pushing and pulling in different directions. Uh, so I think also that young people and activists have a, a huge role to play in in shifting the narrative and and in talking about what is important. I think there is a a real um, leap in 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 the view of, of nuclear power between those of us of a of a certain age who lived through so for example a Three Mile Island meltdown and and those those say for example living in France today who rely on on nuclear power mm -hmm. uh, we have a great question here from Ella uh, <clears throat> about nuclear power and 
The question, doctor, is when scholars say that nuclear energy is safe, are they considering the risks that war and even terrorism pose to nuclear plants? The news recently reported major advancements in the technology related to nuclear fusion versus nuclear fission. What do you think the impact of this new technology could be? That is a really good question. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I think when uh, scientists say that uh, or claim that nuclear power is safe, I think they really believe that. And I think they are aware of the risks. And given uh, the, the new developments in uh, nuclear kind of energy um, generation, uh, there are, for example, small nuclear power plants that are being uh, considered and, and, and discussed. And I know this also from a Swedish perspective, where um, a lot of people are actually starting to to talk about this new technology and, and that that would be not a return to the old nuclear uh, energy, but uh, a greater use of this uh, new, te new technology. Of course, um, yeah, the, the, the dangers are, I mean, we can see them in real time, the dangers against nuclear plants and, and terrorism and so, I think that that is also, so all of this is intersected. This really kind of shows us, us the intersection between energy security, uh, sustainability. Uh, and so that is something that we have to contend with. Security is important, energy security is important. Um, so that is something the international community, international bodies need to, 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 to work with. And this will become an even greater issue uh, in the future. Well, the future is, uh, is future fairly, <laughs> fairly fairly unpredictable, but yeah. uh, but but certainly, I think for those of us who live through some of those things, there's a nuclear energy holds an awful lot of potential. Uh, thank you for that question, Ella. Uh, our next question from uh, Xing Zhu. Uh, please forgive my butchering if I mispronounce your name, uh, says, uh, thank you for such a good lecture, doctor. Besides the efforts that governments and international organizations should make on energy issues, how can the private sector be mobilized? After all, using new energy for production may require higher costs and not see high profits in the short term. And the subsidies that the state can give are limited. Further, the energy structure of some countries, particularly developing countries, have not yet been transformed and upgraded, which means that many of those enterprises lack the infrastructure to adapt uh, to new energy sources. Great question. So are there are there some sort of incentivizations? How can we mobilize the private sector uh, on this? We know that sort of the world is motivated by profit um, and, uh, and, and clean energy is, uh, is in all of our best interests. What do you think about that, doctor? That's also a really, really good question. And I think one of the reasons why uh, international corporations today actually are interested in renewable energy is also that they pay very much close attention to public opinion. Public opinion is very much in favor of renewables. And of course, as I, as I discussed in, in my lecture, there are huge differences uh, between poor and rich countries and um, the resources that they have. And also I discussed, for example, what was happening uh, at the UN climate conference in Sharm el-Sheikh. And at these climate change conferences, there are of course international uh, organizations, um, non-government organizations and government organizations, but there are also a lot of companies, corporations that are present and all of this kind of work together. So uh, we need to put pressure on our governments and we need to work as citizens to uh, convince uh, companies and governments to work together to share technology and do so with 
poorer countries. It, we live in an in, in their interdependent world. So what happens in other countries are something that concern us and should concern us. So we, we simply cannot go on believing that uh, poor, what happens in rich countries and what rich countries and rich corporations in Western countries can do is separate separate from uh, developing countries. So there needs to be much larger focus on this. And, and uh, so that's where the debate and the narrative uh, need, need to work towards. And, and we all have a role to play in that. Terrific. And probably uh, uh, our last question or two uh, would, uh, it comes from, uh, Sheng Sheng Zheng, um, please again forgive my attempt at pr pronunciation. Uh, and uh, the, that student says, "Thank you for your wonderful explanation. I'd like to know your opinion on the current situation of multilateral agreements signed by the international community in the field of energy." Thank you. Um, so, um, I, I mean, there are there are there are many. Um, I mean um agreements signed so i i don't really know what specific agreements you you you're, well, you're referring to so uh, let me maybe frame it differently uh kapka just met uh and uh oh, it, yes it was perhaps um less successful than some would have hoped uh, for example, and I, and I just read an article where the United Arab Emirates just appointed the head of their state oil company to be the representative to Kapka. Uh, are, it, it, do any of these multilateral international agreements or organizations, do they have the power to, to really foment change uh, or is it, is it lip service? How's that? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a very clear and, and, so I think that, as we all know, uh, for example, with regards to another important uh, international body, uh, United Nations, for example, all these uh, agreements are, are made by actors and those actors always have their own interests. And so, no, I mean, I, I don't think that it's always lip service, but uh, when an agreement has been made, people need to reinforce that agreement. There needs to be actors that work together uh, to put pressure. And so we, yeah, so we cannot consider uh, bodies, international bodies, inter actors as a lump sums of, in, of as inanimate objects. They are made up of actors uh individuals that that can be uh persuaded so so that is always the case so we all uh, people have uh, governments uh non-governmental organizations activists all have their work cut out for them to to try to to persuade and and change things such a difficult position for such an important topic. Yes. Dr. Biden, I just wanted to say on behalf of NOVA and all of our summit attendees, how valuable this session was and how much we appreciate your time. I'd like to thank all of the NOVA uh, sort of support staff and Dr. Biden and, of course, uh, our summit alumni and attendees. And with that, I would say that, unfortunately, our time with you this morning is up, but you have our thanks and we certainly hope to be working with you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor. And with that, our session's at a close. Summit attendees and alumni, I will see you at the third installment of our uh, virtual summit guest lecture series uh, coming up next week. Thank you all. <laughs>